Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Journalism in 24-7 Environment panel. My name is Zella Chin. I'm with the Duke Class of 2003. I'm a president of the Duke Hong Kong, and I'm principal reporter with TVB, Hong Kong's flagship broadcaster. So if everyone in this session can keep your cameras on, we wanna see you and leave your mics on mute, and you can just um, chat in the chat box. So I will be the moderator for this session and our panelists are Amrit Ramkumar, class of 2017. He's a markets reporter with the Wall Street Journal. And we have Emily Feng, class of 2015, Beijing correspondent for NPR. And last but not least, Mangish Hatikudur, class of 2001, who recently founded a production company, Kaleidoscope. So why don't we start with our youngest alumni, um, Amrit. So how did you go from being a Duke student to working at the Wall Street Journal as a markets reporter? Yes, yeah, quite a journey and thank you. And thank you to everyone who putting on the event, really happy to be here. But uh, yeah, for me, it was all about the Chronicle uh, while I was at Duke. I say I majored in political science, but really I majored in the Chronicle and that's that middle photo there where I'm asleep at 5 a.m. in the Chronicle office and did not go back to my dorm room. Uh, I'm ashamed to admit that that was also me in class time sometimes. Uh, but yeah, I covered sports at the Chronicle actually. So that's the photo on the right, uh, was a signed basketball that some of my Chronicle friends got for me upon graduation. And the one on the left is me covering the Sun Bowl when Duke football was pretty good and playing in El Paso around Christmas time. So. Christmas in El Paso was an adventure, but yeah, all those different experiences at the Chronicle and uh, being editor in chief as a junior and then sports editor as a senior and running the organization and getting the hands-on experience really allowed me to pivot to markets reporting after I graduated. So I didn't know anything about economics, finance or anything. And now I'm a total markets nerd four years later. And uh, learning the skills, learning how to write on deadline, learning how to edit, learning how to publish digital articles in a 24-7 environment yourself. Uh, all those things were really valuable. So yeah, it's I've been at the journal since graduating and I write about a bunch of different finance topics. So uh, owe it all to Duke and the Chronicle for sure. Amrit, how did you get from sports writing to writing about the markets? How do you pick up those skills? Uh, well, the reason I did it was to have a job after graduation, so I wanted to maybe try to go into sports journalism, but the market was really tough, and uh, the Chronicle has a history of like sending people to Bloomberg and the Journal and these other places, so I was able to intern uh, in the business journalism area a few times, and yeah, I realized that was a good path to a stable job in a big market, and there are actually a lot of similarities as far as using data in your work. Uh, so yeah, I, and picking winners and losers, like I tried to take things from sports, uh, that were not obviously sitting courtside at Cameron Indoor and <laughs> being hit in the back of the head by Cameron crazies and getting blue paint on all my clothes. Uh, but I tried to take the things that I could to writing about finance and yeah, it's, I, I think there's so many like fundamental things you need as a journalist to bounce around different beats. And a lot of the similarities apply, like I was saying before. So uh, I just tried to take what I could and read as much as I could and absorb everything. So, yeah. All right. So, Emily's turn. Tell me, how did you go from being a Duke student to um, a Beijing correspondent for NPR? It was a bit of a just lucky break. I didn't know what I wanted to do after graduation, and I traveled around the Southeast and East Asian region a little bit. I had done that before for academic research through Duke and thanks to a number of Duke grants. I also worked on the Duke East Asian Nexus with Jack Zhang who is on this call and, and wrote a little note in the chat and that was much more academic but it was a channel at least to look at issues beyond what I was studying which was public policy at Duke. And so after graduation, I just up and moved to Beijing and I freelanced. And I thought about moving to Myanmar before that. And I had traveled around the region uh, my spring semester, senior year. But it just didn't seem 
like a good place yet to do journalism. And it seemed like the whole thing could fall apart really quickly, which it did. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Beijing and then I freelanced for about a year. I joined the Financial Times, which I think is a path that, you know, what Amrit said really, really resonated. A lot of the jobs, particularly at the entry level, and they're great jobs, particularly um, for people who are training on how to work in a 24 seven news cycle are going to be in corporate or business journalism. So like Amrit, I had no idea how finance worked. I had no idea how markets worked, but it was a great crash course in, in Chinese institutions in this case. And I did that for about two years. I had always loved radio. I grew up in the era of streaming. So I didn't so much listen to the actual physical radio, but I was downloading podcasts. I was listening to All Things Considered through podcast form and uh, knew the NPR Beijing correspondent here. So when he left and the position opened, I thought, there is not a chance that I qualify for this. But thanks to him and thanks to uh, the former Shanghai correspondent here as well for NPR, they, they really pushed me to apply and said, it doesn't matter if you have no radio experience, if you don't have 10 years reporting experience, just try. We think you could be really good at this. And I'm really grateful to them because I did. And, and now I'm here reporting for NPR, which is a great job. So tell me, what are you doing in this photo? So this was in May or so last year, March maybe, and it was right after lockdowns were lifted in China and people were going out in droves and you could see people exercising again. And one thing I love about Beijing are their parks because there's such great civic spaces, all sorts of people go and they do really strange things. Like this woman who was just hanging upside down in a tree. And so we taped the entire interview while she was doing her calisthenics there. Uh, and she was super chatty and cute. And it was just a great moment because everyone had been cooped up for three months. I mean, she in particular, I think, had like not even left her tiny, tiny house for three whole months. Uh, and so the first thing she did was go hang upside down at her favorite tree. <laughs> you did a photo story with this, right? It wasn't just audio because it's so visual, the story. Yeah, I think this was some kind of audio and photo essay about people airing themselves out after lockdown. We can all understand that one and relate, I think. <laughs> all right, so Mangesh, you are next. You're, you are a media entrepreneur. So tell me, how did you go from uh, Duke to uh, starting your own company? Yeah, sure. And and uh, th thanks thanks for having me. Um, I Before I, I came to Duke, I, I'd done an internship in advertising in India. And so uh, I had spent a summer um, around super, super creative people and, and working on projects for, for like a washing machine advertisement. And at the end of the summer, I thought like, this was so fun, it was so creative, so, so much talent was getting put into this. But at the end of the day, I was making one washing machine seem better than another washing machine when they were just <laughs> washing machine. And, and so like I, I came into Duke trying to figure out like, how, how do you use creativity in a way that's like really beneficial and interesting? And, and how do you capture some of that same spirit while um, while doing something I you know I, I wanted to do with my life and so I came in to Duke. Um, the people in this photo are from my freshman dorm. They're all uh, 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 brilliant and and silly and idiots and uh, but but all uh, from different. Um, they, they all study different things and so late at night in our freshman dorm room we would gather in a room and we would all talk until like three in the morning on a regular basis about like what we were learning in our classes and have these debates that were ridiculous and smart and funny and like, and just sharing this like joy of learning. And so Will Pearson, who's in actually both of these photos, uh, he lived next door to me and, and we were saying, you know, we come to Duke, we don't really know what we want to study. We, we survey all these classes. And, and then we're gonna leave and we're gonna probably be like, uh, we'll probably have to pick one career and not know what we're gonna do. And, and so we thought, wouldn't it be great if there was a magazine that came into your house and it treated all culture like pop culture and you could just skim it and keep learning. And it sounded like your professors um, hanging out with you at a bar and just like teasing you with great information. And so our junior year, we uh, fundraised on campus and we put out a, a campus publication called Mental Floss. And then we spent our senior year um, getting it into Barnes and Noble. And so just before we graduated, uh, it, it went to newsstands. And, um, and this was uh, 2001, uh, right before our second issue came out, 9-11 hit. And, 
you know, we'd started the magazine without knowing anything about the industry. Neither of us had been in journalism. Um, it's that mix of like being cocky and naive that you are when, when you're in college and, and you're excited to do something. And, and so we, you know, um, and that year we saw a bunch of magazines fold from like Mademoiselle to Talk to George Magazine, like all these big magazines. And we couldn't get any advertising. We were working part-time jobs. And so we were trying to figure out how do we keep this thing going? Uh, and, and so we just kept building and building by trying to stretch the brand while figuring out how to delight our audience. And so like we had written headlines that were really punny and we thought like, these are so ephemeral, but what if you put them on t-shirts? And then we started this whole t-shirt business or we said like, um, uh, we, we tried to do things that, that made a little bit of noise. And, and so like we made a, a swimsuit issue for Metal Floss and we found real photos of like Einstein and, and Eleanor Roosevelt and Louis Armstrong, like, and, and we put it on stands and it sold terribly, but CNN called us and said, do you want to do a weekly feature? And so we did. And, and, uh, and, and then Harper Collins called and said, do you want to do a book? And it turned into 12 books and we did board games. And, you know, we kept building this brand without any advertising, essentially, that that was profitable without it. And we just delighted, we worked on delighting our audience. And, you know, it, it's one of those things that when you're young and you start something, people are really rooting for you. And I think the university really rooted for us and, and kept making connections for us. And, and, uh, and then 11 years later, we sold it. Um, I kept working at Mental Floss for, for another four or five years. Uh, and then this company called How Stuff Works recruited both Will and me to, um, uh, to make their podcast more ambitious. And it was an educational company. And I kind of wanted that same feeling of connection that you got from the early magazine where people would write in and, and we responded to every letter that came in. And so podcasting felt like that. Um, it sold to iHeart and, and the last two years I've gotten to do some amazing projects with like, you know, I, I made many drivers, uh, podcast, Hillary Clinton's podcast, Mayor Pete's podcast. Like, um, we had at one point the number one and two show in the country, like uh, things with Buzzfeed and Vice. And like, it's been so fun, um, to, to work at a big corporation, but that's really my first job aside from waiting tables. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, um, now and then I, I left it just a couple of weeks ago uh and and i love iheart but but i i thought you know wouldn't it be fun to try to use this for international stories and try to to use a bullhorn to um to to increase empathy because i i think um i i think uh stories can do that that's a great duke story and love that <laughs> Okay, so my next question is about working in the 24-7 news environment. Um, but first, I wanted to share a little bit about my career working in the 24-7 news. So after graduating, I landed a job at CNN headquarters in Atlanta, and it wasn't glamorous at all. I was literally getting Anchor's coffee. I was putting their news scripts in numerical order, so if their teleprompter falls, they can still refer to their paper scripts on their desks. And as you know, CNN has um, shows 24 hours. So I was doing, going into work at 4.30 in the morning. Or I started at 10 o'clock at night and I did that for a couple of years and then I came out to Hong Kong. So since our panel is on journalism, the 24 seven news environment, I wanted to um, ask Amrith first, how does this affect your day-to-day -day life? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically since I was, at the Chronicle, I've gotten used to always being on email, always being on Twitter, whatever beat I'm on, like following what's going on. I think, uh, especially now in the pandemic, working from home too, there's not really a huge separation oftentimes between uh, your work and home life. Uh, like even now I'm visiting my brother and sister-in-law and niece in DC, and I have a story pubbing in a few hours at midnight that's pretty big, and I've had to be on email and aware of what's going on. I mean, that's just like the reality of the 24 7 news cycle and that's what our readers demand when big things happen in markets like a few weeks ago when there's a like gas shortage in north carolina and other states uh, like people want the story now whenever it happens and you have to give it to them so uh, i think that comes with a lot of pressure and responsibilities but we're also so lucky that we have the tools to do that and respond uh and yeah it's just exhilarating i think is how i try to look at it to stay positive, but there are definitely days when uh, things are crazy or you're kind of beaten down and need a minute. And to your, I think a few other people have said this, like 
working for these big media organizations, that's one of the biggest benefits too. Uh, you have the support you need uh, from a tech standpoint, from a teamwork standpoint. So I think those benefits have been really helpful too. Omra, thank you so much for being with us. I know how hard it is to be on deadline and still taking time to uh, be in a panel discussion. I'm not sure I would be so generous, but you are amazing. So props to you. Well, to be clear, the story's all, all good and done. I was just, as an example, like earlier Oh, you work today. ahead. I, I need the pressure of the deadline to get me going. Yeah. So <laughs> that's when I'm the most creative. So Emily, tell me, how is your career and your life affected by the 24 seven news environment? I echo everything Amrith has said. I think another challenge with working abroad is that your headquarters is a few hours either behind or ahead of you. So I work in exact opposite hours to headquarters, meaning I have early stuff here, usually China time, because a lot of my sources and stories are based here, but people have questions or editors wake up and something in the US happens that might have an uh, impact on what happens in China. And that usually happens starting at 8 or 9 p.m. my time. So it's just being flexible and getting more used to doing things in the middle of your day rather than at the end of the day uh, and, and multitasking that way. But what's great about radio is things are scheduled. So like you can be really, really quick on the ball, but the fastest it can go out is the next newscast or the next radio show. And radio shows have a certain time limit. Like they can only take a certain amount of stories. So sometimes you'll just write a story up for the website, um, or you'll wait for the next newscast just every half hour to update the news. So you've really got to be on top of the ball. But at the same time, it's a little bit more relaxed than, say, publishing directly onto a website because they want that, like, and for a wire, they want that that second. Whereas radio, you've got like a 15, 20 minute buffer usually. And also, it's really fast doing radio for news. Like, I remember when I was the FT, I would give myself stomach ulcers because I'd be sitting there trying to write 400 words as fast as possible. Whereas if it's really breaking and we want it for newscast on radio, at least it's like a 20 to 40 second news spot. And that takes, I don't know if you're fast, five to 15 minutes to, to write, record, edit and, and all that stuff. So it's easier for me, I think for radio to, at least coming from a print background. I know some radio, radio reporters have, have struggled to go from purely feature reporting to doing news as well. But coming from a place like the FT and then going to NPR it's way easier for me to kind of just do the news for the day and then sit down with a few like four or five hours to really focus on, well, where's my next reporting trip going to be? How am I going to shape the story that I've already reported that's enterprise? And so I, I've liked that rhythm about NPR. And the other, um, I think, unique thing about radio in the 24 seven environment is that we have very, very different formats. So I mentioned newscasts, which are these really short breaking news items, but then we have the news shows, which are like three to eight minute long pieces. And then we have podcasts, which can be like 40 to 60 minutes. So at any time you're working on all of these different formats and they're all regarding news that's happening all the time, but you're also thinking very differently about how to package them. And if it's a really long story, you're also thinking about storytelling elements. So that's fun. I think it like brightens up what can be a pretty tiring news cycle. And you're the only one um, from NPR in China? Currently, we usually have a Shanghai bureau chief and we have two producers, one for each bureau. And there are people back in headquarters who help out as well, particularly with the, the web only stuff. But yeah, we haven't had two China correspondents in, in China for three years now for a variety of reasons, mostly US-China relations. Like we just couldn't get visas. It took forever to get mine. And now the pandemic, China won't give any more visas as well. So um, yeah, I've been stuck here by myself. So thank you for all your hard work. It's a lot of responsibility being in charge of an entire country like that. We appreciate it. Yeah, all right. now, now you give me stressed when you put it that way. I try not to think about that. All right, we're gonna get Mangish back into the conversation and I'm gonna start off with a uh, harder one for you. So how does your identity help or hurt your career? Um, I think I think it's mostly helped. I mean, I, I think um, growing up speaking a different language at home and then uh, and then going to India every few summers and spending time with my cousins, spending the whole summer there. Um, 
I, I felt like I was always kind of uh, a diplomat in a way, like like you're always kind of explaining worlds to other people, and and like you know whether it was like Indian cousins who thought like oh, America is all Baywatch or like people in the US thinking, oh, India is all like um, poor people who you can help for like a dollar, you know, for, for like what you'd, you'd spend on coffee. Like, like I, I think I think constantly like explaining and showing what's exciting about like the other culture and like like in a way like constantly selling, you know, like, like uh, in, in a way that was like authentic, I, I think made me, um, made me good at it, like what I do, which is like taking subjects that you shouldn't care about and making you want to care about them. But Mangish, we talk a lot about the um, bamboo ceiling and how there's this invisible barrier where Asian Americans and Asians can't crack, right? To get beyond that. And, but you've been in management for a couple of years and you're gonna start another one of your, another company. How did you, um, make that leap? Any advice you can give to everybody else? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I think I couldn't, even coming from Duke and stuff like that, like I, I applied for a lot of internships and I didn't get them because they're so insular. They're handed down to like, you know, people who work at those companies, like, you know, their, their kids. And, and uh, so I, I think, you know, you hear this a lot in Hollywood, right? Like, like if you're not gonna get a part, write the part you want. And, and so in, in some ways, this magazine was the magazine I wanted. It, I, I wouldn't have been able to like, certainly walk into like a, a job editing anywhere else. But, um, but I think that um, what we tried to do both with the magazine and, and with the staff was, was always give voices to other people. And I, I think we got better and better over time. Um, I, I think we had probably more gay voices and more women on staff than, than a lot of our like peers. We had very, very tiny staffs, but, um, and, and at iHeart, the big stories I commissioned, um, they, they all had like voices that were representative. And, and so like, I, I, I think that, which wasn't, you know, across the board for like, like if you look at the narrative shows I did, which, you know, like they had, um, you just saw like a, a diversity that you wouldn't see across most of the shows. And so like, I, I think I've always tried to give opportunities to people, but, but the other thing is like, I, I think that like, what I didn't find, like like what I lacked from starting our own magazine and what I really craved was like some sort of apprenticeship that there used to be in in uh, journalism, right? Like like used to be able to look over the shoulder of someone and see how edits worked or like get some advice or like, you know, have your copy all scratched out. And like, like because I didn't have that, we tried to create systems both at Mental Floss and then, and then much more at How Stuff Works and iHeart where like young editors who like maybe didn't go to the, um, the fanciest of colleges or like, you know, like we gave opportunities to everyone, but then let them look over the shoulder of really talented people consistently and, and, and just trying to give everyone opportunities, trying to give, like, I wanted, you know, I'd already done mental floss. Like, it doesn't really matter what's on my resume. If you look at my LinkedIn, like, I, I think the biggest highlight is that, like, I was like the a, a deputy fire director, like, you know, like, for the fifth floor. And, and so, so, like, I, I'm not worried about that, but but I but I am worried that like you know other people should get things that they can be proud of on their resumes, and so like I'm always looking for right. that. Thank you, Mangish. We're going to let uh, Amrith and Emily also chime in on this question because it's very important. Um, how about Amrith? How did your um, identity help or hurt your career? Yeah, I'd echo a lot of what was said. I would say it was nearly all help. Uh, it was the same thing growing up as the son of Indian immigrants in Norman, Oklahoma, my whole life. It's a lot of educating in like both directions on different cultures, like learning a lot and taking that in. Um, but there was I, an like, issue at Wall Street Journal recently you were sharing with me. Yeah, there have been several, I think, go, even going back to my time at the Chronicle, like when I became editor, there were some nasty comments about uh, an Indian person being editor of the Chronicle, which I like there's so there's so much work that needs to happen in all of our communities. But yeah, even at the journal, uh, we're always working to separate and use an opinion. And our opinion section is known for being a very certain way. And 
sometimes publishing things, citing refuted academic studies and attacking people of color and things like that. And so, yeah, a lot of us uh, reporters have banded together and sent notes to like the high up editors and we're always pushing for more diversity, more transparency, more giant things that say this is news, this is opinion. And uh, yeah, this is all public and it's been reported in other outlets. And yeah, a lot of us are going to keep pushing for those changes and uh, it needs to happen across the industry and everywhere. But yeah, I think coming from the background again and again, getting the experience at Duke, seeing what it's like, uh, like running the paper and having some controversial, not great opinion pieces go out and dealing with the fallout and understanding that side of it too, I think has been uh, been really helpful. Sounds like Duke was a good training ground for this. So um, let's get Emily in on this question. Um, and your response is a little different because you actually um, are Asian American, but live and work in China. How has your identity helped or hurt your career? Mostly it helps. Like the reason why I moved here was I did have an intellectual interest in China and the region, but it was more just that I had the language ability. So I knew that I could get at least uh, an entry level job here at some point. And um, I didn't need an assistant to work around back when I was a freelancer. And you see the model of foreign correspondents changing a lot along these lines, where before it was often these more senior correspondents who would get sent out to countries and they always worked with local interpreters or fixers. And in China, there's a very set system that that encourages this. But now you see more and more people who have studied the language or have a family background come out. And it's been their goal in journalism to work out in Beijing or Shanghai and report the news. And I think you see better stories as a result over the last 10, 20 years because of correspondence with that interest. I think where identity has become a little more complex when it comes to reporting stories in China um, is, is I think China has a very essentialist nature on, on identity. And so if you look a certain way, if you have a certain last name, people automatically assume that even if you weren't born here, because you can tell them that over and over again, they still think deep down, you must, you must be Chinese. You must have some innate ability to speak the language or to understand the culture. And so it can be doubly alienating to both listeners and readers uh, who might assume that you were that you grew up in a certain place and to people that you're talking to and living next to in China. But I, I say that not as a complaint, just as an observation. I think it always puts you on guard because you're constantly, as Mangish says, explaining things to everyone here. And for the most part, it lets me blend in. Like I think particularly over the last four years or so as reporting conditions have gotten way worse here, at least being able to do reporting trips outside of Beijing, which is always the most tightly, well, not always, but mostly, most of the time, tightly controlled and going out to the boonie somewhere and people, at least for the first hour or two, don't know that you're a foreigner. Um, obviously, when you interview people, you have to tell them that you're a foreign journalist, but at least getting around in transportation and, and getting into places um, that are normally publicly accessible to, to Chinese people and looking a certain way is really, really helpful. So I think it's it's allowed me to, to cover the country better and to get out to places that are not just the big cities because, because I have these language abilities and because I look a certain way. Great, thank you, Emily. We are gonna go straight to um, audience questions. There are a bunch here that um, I wanted to get to. And actually, Emily, that was, was a good, pretty good segue to a question from Pei in Shanghai. Hey, Pei, good to see you. Um, he asked, how do you navigate the spirit of open journalistic inquiry amid the sensitive, changing domestic political and climate where you live? Good question. I think you just end up having to do more work. It's, it's like on one hand, you're, you're doing the actual job, but you're also doing so much work explaining how difficult it is to do that job to your editors. Also, it's a little bit of self-defense because they'll often be like, well, why can't you get this interview? <laughs> like, why, why is this piece not on my desk right now? And you're like, listen, I really tried, but I reached out to 30 people and they all said no, or I went on this reporting trip and I got there and everyone freaked out because the police were there, so I had to leave. Um, there's that. And then there's also sort of like educating uh, the authorities that be here. The department that directly oversees us is the foreign ministry. And I think it's just always a constant learning process. They have good intentions, but it's different ministries like public security and police and, and state security and things who 
really tried to put the kibosh on reporting. And so it's just constantly like interfacing these foreign ministry officials and being like, well, that's foreign journalists are not here to serve the communist party. They're here to like put truth to power and like question what the official line is and constantly explaining that and holding them to their word and pointing out discrepancies in the way that, that journalists are treated or, um, so, so it's a lot of extra work, I think, on top of the job, but um, it's still possible. People still do really, really great reporting here. I just think um, at the end of the day, it becomes a, um, a numbers game. You've got to try like 10 times the amount of people you would try in the US or Europe to get someone to talk to you. But at the end of the day, you can still probably find someone who, who will talk to you. And I'm a little bit biased. I think journalism means a lot internationally in places where they don't have the culture that we grew up in in the US, right? Freedom of press, freedom of expression. So thank you very much for your hard work. Um, we have some more questions back to you, Amrith, about the deadline pressure. So uh, Debbie and Jack have similar questions in terms of how to ensure the quality of your stories when you're working under shorter deadlines. And how do you balance that deadline pressure and intellectual growth? How do you find time to think about the big <laughs> picture? Or is that the editor's job and not yours? Yeah, two really good questions. Uh, quality wise, I think just like repetition helps a lot and kind of mastering a certain topic. So definitely at the beginning, it's much harder, uh, especially on something like markets, that's pretty complicated. But a few years in now, I feel like sometimes I could just write about oil markets in my sleep when there's not much going on. And uh, it can go pretty fast and I feel pretty comfortable with like what's been going on recently and the context and the major players and things like that. So. I think, yeah, like kind of having that mastery is important. Uh, and you learn like little tricks, like uh, you don't need to put a million numbers that are very specific. You can always use like approximations, add words like about roughly. Uh, I like writing around what you don't know is something I'm always getting better at. And yeah, something I've improved a lot on, especially when on deadline. And uh, another response to these questions is like, I'm really lucky to work at the journal where uh, our markets team and our finance team, like we're not always doing a ton of day-to-day -day stuff, I would say, like our peers care a lot more and prioritize like really quick, uh, constant market updates. But uh, especially now that I've been on the team for like almost four years, I have a lot of time to pursue like deep reporting projects and do a lot of uh, deep thinking. In fact, I think sometimes at the journal, we do too much deep thinking and not enough quick reporting when my stories get edited for three months. and don't get published and things change a lot uh, in the world. But uh, yeah, I'm lucky that I'm kind of able to balance both and uh, kind of pick and choose what projects to prioritize at times. All right. So if um, anybody else has questions, feel free to drop them into the chat and I'll try to get to all of them. This next one question I wanna to give to Mangish since your career has um, spanned quite a lot of time, quite a lot of years, do you, this is from Rajit Raj. Do you feel like your role in journalism has changed from delivering the news as it is to policing the news to make sure there's accuracy and reduce bias given how fast news travels now on social media platforms? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I'm probably less uh, less in the news world than, than anyone else here. Like we did, you know, I did a show with uh, with BuzzFeed called Impeachment Today, which was a daily, you know, like that, that we uh, turned out every day. I think, um, I think I, like our perspective from Mental Floss was very much like trying to get everyone in the door. And so it was not like particularly political. And, and so it was, uh, or, or it was, but, but, um, but it was making arguments in a very like uh, open way that, that everyone could appreciate. So like you walk away appreciating like a civil rights leader or something like that, like versus like um, uh, anyone perceiving the bias immediately, you know, uh, but, but, but I'd say, um, you know, I, I, I think that misinformation had become such a big thing that, that we're constantly fighting that. And like, how do you get people who are only relying on the news sources that they regularly lean on to like open their minds to other ideas? And so like in that way, we were um, trying to bring voices 
trying to make people listen to voices that they wouldn't ordinarily listen to, like through vehicles, like um, using a crime story to get people uh, in the door to listen to like a black mom's voice, you know, like like uh, using um, a noir story similarly to like to learn about a femicide in in Juarez, you know, where where hundreds of women were killed and like you know uh, and change their minds on immigration and and not just believe what you know Breitbart or or whatever your news source might be and and we saw it really being very effective. So I mean that's how we kind of tried to counter the the new cycle, but um, I'm sure the other panelists have a better answer for this. <laughs> we have different views, but I wanted to um, ask Emily, since uh, your time at uh, in China, the US-China relationship has changed quite a lot. So in that context, do you feel that your role in journalism has changed from delivering the news to maybe policing the news to make sure that you don't get bias in there? I won't say the role has changed, but certainly the function of policing the news has become essential to producing the news. Because in, in the news cycle, there's always a pressure to match stories. So your editors will see something from a rival outlet or even a Chinese outlet that is a you know, state one that's getting much more access to government officials than you. And they ask, well, is this true? Can you do a similar story? Is there something bigger here that you can look into? So you're constantly reading other people's work and um, trying to figure out, well, how much of this is worthwhile? How much of this is fair? Is this an interesting topic, but has it been covered in a way that's not totally accurate? And can I do a better job? And a lot of my work is, is turning down requests from editors because their job is to fill, it's to fill the shows, it's to fill the page, and your job is to make sure that the guests they book, the pieces of yours that go on air, um, the pieces often that other people are writing, that they're about China, are, are fair and accurate. And, and making sure that it's, it's um, filling a need that hasn't been covered by other outlets, but also is doing so in a way that is, is precise, that is, that is objectively true. Um, I also have to be a little bit um, judicious in, in where I allocate my time because I'm just one person. I have to cover the news. I have to do enterprise reporting. What am I going to invest my time on um, if I'm going to spend, say, a week on a reporting trip about a topic? Is it a topic that has been undercovered by people? And so, therefore, I feel like it's worth this, this time of mine to, to spend on it. I think those choices of what to cover are also a form of trying to balance how a topic is covered, how a country is covered. And then I have to do more of because if you if you don't like filter that, you're going to get requests uh, left and right that are going to pull you in ways um, that will lead to I think unbalanced coverage. So David has a question for you, Emily. Um, how much are you deciding on your stories, and how much are they being set by uh, headquarters? For me, almost entirely, it's it's up to me. Where there are editor requests, or is when there's breaking news, often international. So like some kind of uh, state level visit or US China issue. And um, if you're listening to NPR news shows, the two ways where like a host is interviewing live another correspondent or interviewing a guest, those are often editor requests. And we're doing those like with very, very little notice, which is why it's a live two way. It's not a produced radio piece. We have another question for you, Emily. You're very popular. <laughs> So this last one comes from uh, Ken. So he asks, have you ever felt threatened while trying to cover a story in China? Yes, but in a totally manageable way. Uh, the biggest threat has always been expulsion and just having like a really short visa, which at this point, the threat has been around for so long that I just don't really care about it. So two years ago, China started expelling more journalists. I mean, they always have, but it comes in waves. And um, so we get these one-year residence permits and, and journalist visas to work. And so they started expelling a bunch of American correspondents. And at a certain point, I mean, even now, I guess um, I'm one of only a few left. And um, now because of stuff that's going on in the US, China's giving us 30 or um, 90 day visas. Um, so it's just more paperwork. And I guess they could decide not to give you a visa at any point, but 
I'm lucky I don't have children. A lot of people have people, you know, children in school here, and they think that would be a huge disruption if they had to move all of a sudden, but I just don't really care. Um, for reporting, it can be a little bit hairy because you'll often book a trip and then you'll get a call from the local um, essentially police or what they call the propaganda department. Um, it's a, a subsidiary of the foreign ministry being like, hey, we know you're coming. Is there any way we could help? But the subtext is, hey, if you're going to come, you can't do any free reporting. We're going to try to arrange everything for you. And then you just got to work around it. So we do things like um, booking our tickets last minute, you know, going super early in the morning and not checking into a hotel because hotels require real name identification with the police. And so doing a full day's reporting before you have to check in. Um, I do everything on encrypted platforms. Um, during COVID, also things were a little bit riskier because even though like national or even local level policy was that you could travel freely with, let's say, a COVID test and a health certificate, every locality would have their own rules. And so you'd get to a place, particularly rural areas, and they would see that you were from Beijing or had a foreign passport and tried to quarantine you in, in like a state hotel for two weeks. So there were some <laughs> close encounters that way. But all of those are manageable. I think the biggest risk again is, is getting a really short visa, um, not being able to hire more people, like just having your other visa application stonewalled, which is what's happening to us. Um, we always have local staff, which, um, and, and they're great because they do some really, really great reporting and interpretation work, but it's been really hard to hire them because that's subject to government approval. Um, and, and so far, I mean, knock on wood, no one's been detained indefinitely, but it's something that is a real risk and something that we're afraid would happen if there's more escalation in, um, yeah, in US-China relations. So uh, yeah, but, but most of the time it, it's very manageable and it's just sort of knowing what your risks are and knowing what's, um, how, you can, how you can ameliorate those. Great, thank you, Emily. Okay, that's all the time we have for our panel discussion. I wanted to thank each of our speakers, Amrit, Emily, and Mangish. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us tonight and Saturday morning. So before we close the symposium, we wanted to spend a few minutes reflecting and sharing some of our takeaways and reactions to what you've heard today. So not just from this session, but from any of the sessions you've attended. So if you aren't already in gallery view, you may want to switch that to see your fellow participants. And we will have a few questions that we want you to answer. We would like to know, um, when did the light bulb go off for you? Share an interesting or surprising revelation that came to you during the symposium. So you can put that into the chat or unmike yourself and share. We have a small group here. So if anybody, any of my panelists wanna start off or um, some of our DAAA board members are on here, they wanted to share something. So the question is, when did the light bulb go off for you? Share an interesting or surprising revelation that came to you during the symposium. Um, I, I can jump in and, and uh, offer something. I thought Deb Liu's keynote address was really fantastic and especially her insight about right, um, vulnerability, right? That, that you can't be a brand because a human is multidimensional, right? And so trying to shoehorn yourself into, into any one thing is, is a sure way to be unhappy and, and probably also unsuccessful. And so, you know, what she shared about uh, vulnerability also came up kind of in, in, in my panel and a lot of the conversations we had about um, the bamboo ceiling and being authentic to yourself and sharing that with other people in, in a way that, you know, that, that contributes to your success and path. Anybody else wanted to share something of what they learned today? Light bulb moment for you? I think everybody's a bit shy here. It's getting quite late for you guys in, in the East Coast. Oh, it's like past dinner time. Okay, we'll head on to the next question then. What is one action step you heard from today that you will apply to your own path, to your own career? Any takeaways from the day or this panel? Hey, good morning. You should say something. Hi from Shanghai. 
um it's it's early for me on a saturday morning even though it's you know not that early but thank you guys so much um and uh uh one of the takeaways i have and i'm, I'm going to run to my sister who also lives out here in shanghai with me uh she interned with npr when she was uh at university of nebraska lincoln and has been working for some foreign magazines out here uh, mostly around expat living uh, lifestyle magazines but it was really hey we're having a hard time hearing you i'm not sure if it's your audio or the epsi um the asian pacific studies institute and uh I um and it's great that has this oh i'm sorry can you okay um can you is it still hard to hear maybe i'll type out my question i don't want to take up everyone's time okay thanks oh, you're just cutting okay. in and out yeah sorry about that um okay i guess on that note i'm going to hand the virtual mic off to raj swaminathan Hi, thank you so much, Zella. So uh, my name is Raj uh, Swaminathan, and uh, I'm a member of the Duke Asian Alumni Alliance or DAAA uh, Board of Directors. Uh, first, just thank you so much for um, uh, to our moderators, our speakers, Zella, Amrith, Emily, Mangish, for uh, an excellent discussion. Uh, I'm not in the journalism space myself, but I found the session to be very enlightening and informative. Um, it's really just great to hear about everyone's journey. Um, I also wanted to thank each of you for being a part of this path to success. Uh, this virtual symposium was the first of what um, we hope will become a signature event for DAAA. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to meet together in person uh, for events on campus uh, soon. And I also wanted to give a special thanks to the Duke Entertainment Media and Arts Network for co-sponsoring three of the sessions. Uh, in addition, to, uh, you know, our greatest appreciation goes to the DAAA staff, organizers, uh, and planning committee who worked tirelessly to produce this symposium uh, under the leadership of our vice chair of programming, Debbie Chang. Um, and from their original vision to marketing, um, speaker recruitment, program planning, um, every one of their contributions um, has really been uh, invaluable. So just in terms of some housekeeping items, I wanted to remind folks that all of these sessions were recorded. So if you weren't able to see everything that you wanted to, you can view any of the recordings on demand. Um, and for the next 30 days, you can use uh, just use the same link that you started with today to um, get uh, get to the virtual attendee hub and just watch the videos of your choice. Um, and then in a few days, you're going to receive a follow up email from us with a reminder about these recordings and also uh, a survey invitation. Please, please complete the survey. Um, the input that we collect will inform our future programs and initiatives. Um, and so, you know, I just want to thank you in advance for uh, for completing that. Uh, we also want to encourage year round engagement. And one of the best tools uh, for that is the Duke Alumni Network. Um, not only can you use the network for one to one connections with fellow alums, um, there's also a group page for DAAA. Um, and the link to the Duke Alumni Network can be found in the virtual attendee hub uh, under the sponsor profiles or anytime at alumni.duke.edu. So with that, um, you know, we hope you really enjoyed this path to success and that you're even more prouder than ever to be a part of Duke's Asian uh, community. And um, on behalf of the, the board uh, of the Duke Asian Alumni Alliance. Um, thanks again for being here. Uh, be well and be forever Duke. Thank you. <laughs>